many problems in the sciences, economics, finance, medicine, and other fields can be translated into algebra problems. This is one of the reasons that algebra is so useful. In this particular uh, video, in the next video, we're going to be using equations as mathematical models to solve real life problems. Now, this is something you actually already know. When you're working with a word problem or application problem or story problem, however your teacher described it, there are some guidelines for putting together your equation and solving it. And the first thing is always to identify the variable. Sometimes you're going to call the variable x just because that's what you're used to. A lot of times we use a variable that starts with the first letter of whatever it is we're trying to find. So it really doesn't matter what you pick, but if you're more comfortable using x, just use x. After you determine what your variable is or what it is you're trying to find, you need to take the words in the problem and translate them into some sort of algebraic equation. Sometimes it's helpful to do this making a diagram or a table. I'll show you some ways of doing it later on. Then you want to set up your model. That's writing the equation. After you get your equation together, then you're going to solve it and don't forget to check your answer. That's a step we often skip, but you need to make sure that your answer makes sense. For example, if you're trying to find the weight of an object and the answer you get at the end is negative, that should send up a red flag saying, wait a second, my weight shouldn't be negative. That doesn't make sense. In example one, let's talk about renting a car. This is probably a problem you've seen before. Not this exact problem, but something very similar to it. A car company charges $30 a day and 15 cents a mile for renting a car. Helen rents a car for two days and her bill comes to $108. How many miles did she drive? First of all, I want to point out this in the uh, book that I got this out of. Instead, wrote it as this. Sorry, that's a little C. When you see 15 cents, remember to convert it to 0.15 when you're working in money. Okay, so the first thing is, what's the variable? What are you trying to find? Well, we're trying to find how many miles she drove. So the miles she drove, we're going to call that X. You could also call it M for miles if that makes you feel better. Okay, so what are some other things happening in the problem? Well, she's um, going 15 cents, she, or she's getting charged 15 cents a mile. How do you write that algebraically? Well, it should be 0.15x, because x is the number of miles she drove. The other thing that's happening is she's getting charged $30 a day for two days. So our daily cost should be two times the daily rate. And her total cost was $108. Well, remember the word total means add it up and it should equal that. So the mileage cost plus the daily cost should equal $108. That's your model. Once you've got your model, now you're going to solve it and make sure the answer that you get is a reasonable number. So 15x plus 30 is equal to 108. I'm going to subtract 30. I get 15x is equal to 48. Nope, that's not right. Hold on a second. I should make this 60 and not 30 while well, I'm screwing this up. Okay, let's try this again. Then I'm going to subtract 60, and 108 minus 60 is 48. And then I'm going to divide by 0.15, and I'm going to find out that x is 320 miles. Well, ask yourself this question. Does that seem like a reasonable answer? It probably does. Well, if it works, then when you plug it back into this model, you better get her total cost to be $108. Another type of real-world modeling that we do is something called simple interest problems. 
Later in the school year, we will talk about more complicated interest problems. Hence the reason this one's called simple interest. The way simple interest works is you find the interest, which is a, basically it's a fee you pay a bank in order to borrow money from them. So if you buy a car, you usually get something called financing, where the bank pays for your car and then you pay the bank back over a certain amount of time, generally five years. But the bank doesn't just give you money and separate how much the car cost over five years. They charge you something called interest so that they can make a little money out of the deal as well. P is a special word. It's called the principal. The principal is the amount of the look like if you bought a car and it was fifteen thousand dollars, the principal would be fifteen thousand dollars. Or sometimes we use these problems for saving money. Like if you put money in the bank, grandma gives you a hundred dollars, so you put a hundred dollars in the bank. We call that the principal. R is your interest rate. The rate is normally given as a percentage, like five percent. So don't forget that you cannot do problems with percents. You have to change them to decimal format. Two ways of doing it. Either move the decimal two places to the left or divide the number by a hundred. Either way you'll get the correct percent as a decimal. T is time. For how long are you paying off this car? For how many years do you want to save money in this account? So just as a forewarning on this next example, the problem is not going to be as easy as just plugging into that equation I just gave you for simple interest, because this is the pre-calc honors class. So let's talk about interest on an investment. Mary is a very lucky woman. She inherits $100,000 and invests it in two certificates of deposit. If you don't know what a certificate of deposit is, they are often called CDs. One certificate pays 6% and the other pays 4.5% simple interest annually. If Mary's total interest is $5,025 per year, how much money is invested at each rate? Okay, so this is what she does. She takes the money, and they didn't say she splits it in half. They just said she takes part of the money and puts it in one CD and takes another part of the money and puts it in another CD. So how about we call X the amount of money invested at 6%? Amount invested at 6%. Because then we can call the other amount, the 4, so 6%, we're going to call that X. So the 4.5%, the amount of money put into that account is 100000 minus X. Basically, I don't know how much money is put into the 6% CD. And the reason we picked the 6% CD to call X is just because it came first in the problem. Okay, so how do you determine the interest? Well, what you do is you take the, the percent and you change it into a decimal. So the interest on the 6% CD is going to be found by doing 0.06 times X. And the interest found on the 4.5% interest CD, you're going to do 0 0.0425, or no, sorry, not 425, 0.045, because that's what a half is, times 100,000 minus X. And we know that when we add the interest from both of these CDs, it better equal $5,025. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do 0.06x plus 0.045 times 100,000 minus x, and that's going to equal 5,025. Well, now I have an equation that I know how to solve. So I'm going to start by distributing 0.06x plus 400, what is it, 4,500 4, minus 0.045x is equal to 5,025. And then I'm going to combine 
some like terms. These are like terms. And I'm going to get 0.015x. And then I'm going to take the 4,500 and subtract it from the other side. I'm going to get 525. And then I'm going to divide by 0.015. And I'm going to get x is 35,000. Does that seem like a reasonable answer? Well, absolutely it does. Okay, so if she puts $35,000 into the 6% CD, then in order to find out how much money she put in the 4.5% CD, you subtract 35000 from 100000 and we're going to find out that she's going to put 65000 in the 4.5% CD. And if you're not sure if you did it correctly, take X, plug it back into this problem up here, and see if your final answer isn't 5,025. Or take 6% of this number and take 0.45% of this number and add them and make sure you get 4,025. When we use algebra to model physical situations, sometimes we have to use basic formulas from geometry. So it's a good time to review some of our geometric concepts. So we may need the formula for the area or perimeter or the formula that relates the sides of similar triangles, or sometimes we just need the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, when you start the school year and you get your textbook, a lot of these formulas will be in the front of the book, but these are, in my mind, formulas you should have memorized. So let's talk about an area problem using the dimensions of a garden. A square garden has a walkway three feet wide around its outer edge. If the area of the entire garden, including the walkway, is 18,000 square feet, what are the dimensions of the planted area? Well, what does this picture look like? you got to draw a picture. So, it's a square, and inside that square is the planted area. So, this is where all my little flowers are. I'll make them different colors, so it looks really nice. I'm getting lazy. Flowers. Walkway. All right. So now let's talk about what the problem told us. It said the walkway is three feet wide. So I, I know from here to here is three feet. I know from here to here is three feet. From here to here is three feet. What I don't know is I don't know this length here. We'll call that x. So when we want to identify the variable, we want to figure out what the dimensions of the planet area are. We want to find their area. Well, in order to find the area, I need to know the length of one of the sides of the square. So my x is going to be the length of the planet area. Now let's talk about what I do know. So the length of the planet area, we're going to call x. What's the length of the entire garden, then? What, what's this length here? Well, isn't it x plus 6? Let's see, we'll call this length of entire garden. It's going to be x plus 6. And the reason it's x plus 6 is because it's x plus 3 plus 3. And then if I know the length of the entire garden and I know it's a square, I know the area of the entire garden. The area of a square is side squared, so it must be x plus 6 squared. Well, in the problem, they told me that the entire garden, including the walkway, was 18,000 square feet. That must mean that x plus 6 squared must equal 18,000. How do I solve that problem? Well, very easily. We're going to take the square root of 18,000, because when I do that, it'll get rid of the square on the left-hand side. And then I'm going to subtract 6. And then I'm going to probably round the answer off 
So when I do that, you should get the answer to be x is approximately 128. What were the units of measurement in this problem again? Oh yeah, they were feet. Don't forget about your units of measurement. Very important stuff. So the question said, what are the dimensions of the planted area? Well, in order to find the planted area, I needed to know x. I know x is about 128, so the dimensions gets written as 128 feet by 128 feet. In example four, we want to find the dimensions of a building lot. A rectangular building lot is eight feet longer than it is wide and has an area of 2,900 square feet. Find the dimensions of the lot. Well, it's a rectangle and it is eight feet longer than it is wide. So guess what? I don't know how wide it is, but I know however wide it is, it's eight feet longer on its length. So my variable x is going to be the width. So that x plus eight is the length. And since I know the area is 2,900 square feet, how do you find the area of a rectangle? Well, length times width, or base times height. So x times x plus 8 must equal 2,900. All right, so how do I solve this? Well, I get x squared plus 8x is equal to 2,900. We reviewed quadratics earlier. The best way to solve this problem is to get it equal to 0. Oops. It is factorable. However, you probably don't want to figure out which two numbers multiply to give you negative 2,900 and add to give you 8. So at this point in time, I would probably just go to the quadratic formula to finish solving this. So x is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Then I would simplify, this is negative 8, plus or minus, simplify the part under the square root, you should get 11,664 all over 2. The square root of 11,664 is 108, so x is equal to negative 8, plus or minus this, oops, not the square root, of 108 all over 2. Remember that this leads us to two answers. One of the answers is negative 8 plus 108 divided by 2, which is going to give me 50. Because if you have a graphing calculator like the TI-84 or TI-83, please do this first before dividing by 2. If you type that into your calculator and you don't use parentheses here, you will get the wrong answer. So be very careful. The other answer would be negative 8 minus 108 over 2, which would give you negative 58. Okay, so we're talking about width. Can the width be negative 58? No, length can never be negative. So even though I got two answers, this is the only acceptable answer. So the width must be 50 feet. And the length must be 50 plus 8 feet. And those are the dimensions of my rectangular lot. The last thing that I'm going to do in this particular video is talk about determining the height of a building using similar triangles. A man who is 6 feet tall wishes to find the height of a certain four-story building. He measures the shadow and finds it to be 20 feet, 28 feet long, while his own shadow is, shadow is 3 and a half feet long. How tall is the building? Well, here's the building. I don't know how high it is, so I'll call that x, but I know the shadow is 28 feet long. And I know that the shadow makes a right triangle with the ground. The guy who measured the shadow, he's over here. Oops, that's not a very good picture. Let's try that again. Here we go. There's a good looking man. Give him some hair, he's smiling. 
He's six feet tall, and his shadow is three and a half feet long, and he also makes a right triangle with the ground. Well, if they both make right triangles, they are similar triangles. So how would I find the height of the building? Well, if you recall, the way similar triangles worked is corresponding sides formed ratios. And the ratios of the corresponding sides had to be equal. So x corresponds with 6, and 28 corresponds with 3.5. And those two should be equal to each other. Well, now that's just a proportion that we're going to solve. So when I cross multiply, I get 3.5x is equal to 168. And then I'm going to divide 168 by 3.5. And I'm going to find out that the building is 48 feet tall. And again, when you get to that point in time, ask yourself, does that make sense? Well, if the guy is 6 feet tall, the building better be taller than him. So 48 feet tall seems like a reasonable answer.